Hello and welcome to uh, Chapter 25, The Origin and Diversification of Eukaryotes. Uh, this is the second lecture in the Unit 2 of the uh, Biology 102 for John Tyler Community College. My name is Mr. Sparks and I'll be guiding you through this lecture. <clears throat> Protist is the informal name of the diverse group of mostly unicellular eukaryotes. As we're going to see throughout this lecture, um, there's uh, quite, a, quite a diverse form and uh, feeding styles of, of these uh, eukaryotes, of the protists. Some protists, like the ciliate didinium, are able to perform dramatic shape changes due to their structural complexity of their cells. Here's um, didinium. It's about to engulf the protist paramecium. Um, the paramecium is as large as the as the uh, didinium itself, but the didinium is able to um, engulf the uh, paramecium into its food vacuole uh, by virtue of the structural complexity of the cell. So it's much uh, much more distinct, much has, has much more structural diversity than the um, than the bacteria than the pro than the prokaryotes. So now we're going to be talking about eukaryotic cells, and eukaryotic cells are all cells that have organelles bound by uh, membranes. So the nucleus has a nuclear membrane, and there are other organelles uh, within the cells. And we're going to be uh, following these, these eukaryotes as they develop greater and greater evolutionary complexity and eventually become the basis for multicellular animals. Eukaryotes arose by endosymbiosis more than 1.8 billion years ago. Endosymbiosis is when one, uh, the eukaryotic organism engulfs another, uh, uh, perhaps a bacteria or even another eukaryotic organism and incorporates it uh, through many generations into its, into its form. Early eukaryotes were unicellular. Eukaryotic cells have organelles and are structurally more complex than prokaryotic cells. A well-developed cytoskeleton enables eukaryotic cells to have asymmetrical forms and to change shape. <clears throat> this is particularly evident in the, in the amoebas. We're going to talk about the amoeba forms um, in, shortly in the lecture. Chemical evidence for the presence of eukaryotes dates back 2.7 billion years ago. I don't know how they extract this information, but apparently it's possible to do so. The earliest fossils of eukaryote cells are 1.8 billion years ago. So I'm pretty confident by confident saying that the earliest eukaryotic cells are almost 2 billion years old. That's, uh, that's a little less than half of the age of the Earth. So we had those uh, complex prokaryotic cells, and then they evolved into... Um, the, the simple prokaryotic cells, and then they evolved into more complex eukaryotic cells. Initial diversification of the eukaryotes occurred 1.8 to 1.3 billion years ago. Novel features of the eukaryotes, including complex multicellularity, sexual life cycles, and photosynthesis, arose 1.3 to 60, 635 million years ago. So about a half a billion to one and a half billion years ago, um, the eukaryotes developed their features that enable them uh, to become the life forms that we now know as protists. The first large multicellular eukaryotes represented the Edicarian biota. The Edicarian is a period of time around the Cambrian era. It evolved 635 to 535 million years ago, about a half a billion years ago. Okay, here is a uh, table that, or a, a calendar that shows you the evolution of the eukaryotes. Here's an ancient uh, 1.8 billion year old fossil eukaryote. It's probably some form of uh, algae uh, out here on the far left. Um, uh, a little more advanced is the tapania. It's a, probably an early algae or fungus. Um, more complicated uh, eukaryotes. Um, um, more complicated algae, they began to have a more filamentous form. 
um, out throughout time. Uh, Bonea, a, a vase-shaped eukaryote, probably uh, similar to a paramecium's today, uh, was found worldwide in rocks 750 million years ago. Okay, and then in the Edicarian fauna, you started to get more complex organisms. Um, the algae uh, Dushina phyton uh, lived about 600 million years ago, and then Springia flounderi was an animal with many body segments, and it was uh, these are more complex organisms that evolved from the eukaryotes. Okay, here's the uh, uh, close-up information or close-up photographs of the uh, 1.8 billion year old fossil. I'm just going to click through these. This is a very long lecture, and um, it, it's got like 140 slides to it, so I'm going to try to go through some of these uh, fairly quickly so we don't spend uh, all day at this lecture. Eukaryotic cells exhibited greater structural complexity than prokaryotic cells as early as 1.5 billion years ago. The earliest multicellular eukaryotic fossils are out of red algae, are of red algae, which dated back 1.2 billion years ago. But m large multicellular eukaryotes did not arise until 635 uh, million years. Okay, so that's about a half a billion years ago. Now, these are, these are long periods of time, but um, you, it's also interesting to understand that the Earth itself is four and a half billion years old, and it, when life began to uh, evolve about 3.5, 3.8 billion years ago, there was a long period of time when the prokaryotes dominated uh, Earth, and then the eukaryotes began to evolve about 1.2 billion years ago. And then in relatively short period of time, those eukaryotes developed increasing complexity that developed into multicellular plants and animals um, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. We're still, well, I'm, I'm talking about uh, by, uh, geological time period. But um, by, uh, you know, the standards of... Uh, anyone's lifespan, we're talking about 650 million years ago, that's, uh, you know, that's roughly half a billion years ago. It's, it's quite an, a long period of time. Severe ice ages from 750 million to, 800 to 580 million years ago may have hindered the rise of large eukaryotes. So it's theoretically possible that large eukaryotes could have evolved earlier if it were not for climactic changes. But since these climactic changes occurred, they probably suppressed the development of larger eukaryotes, more complex eukaryotes. DNA sequence data indicate that eukaryotes are a combination of organisms. So eukaryotes are uh, simple um, one-cell organisms that have parts from uh, bacteria and possibly other eukaryotic organisms incorporated into them. This is a process known as endosymbiosis. Eukaryotic genes and characteristics show evidence of both archaeal and bacterial origins. Evidence of mixed origins may be a consequence of endosymbiosis, a symbiotic relationship in which one organism lives inside the body or cell of another organism. Okay, so here's a table that describes um, uh, different uh, features that, that suggest uh, the origins of these complicated parts of eukaryotic features. Okay, so DNA replication enzymes um, seem to be more closely related to the archaea, transcription enzymes to the archaea, translation enzymes, mostly archaea, cell division apparatus, mostly archaea, endoplasmic reticulum, archaea and bacterial 
Mitochondria are mo uh, mostly bac are bacterial, and certain metabolic genes are mostly bacterial. So the the one celled eukaryotes uh, it apparently incorporated all of these uh, different organisms into its into itself, and over periods of generations and through evolution and natural selection, um, these so these uh, properties conferred advantageous traits onto the eukaryotes and it passed these traits and these sections of, uh, of bacterial uh, of the bacteria and the archaea onto its progeny. This is kind of like lateral gene transfer in prokaryotes where advantageous traits can be transferred from one prokaryote to another um, but it's a little more complicated than that because we're talking about uh, complete uh, prokaryotes being uh, uh, subsumed by the eukaryotic uh, individual and then incorporated into its its own um, biological functioning. There's a little more information on this uh, table on page 484. The endosymbiont theory proposed that mitochondria and plastids, plastids are mostly associated with um, chloroplasts. Um, they are were formerly small prokaryotes that began living within larger cells. An endosymbiont is a cell that lives within a host cell. Prokaryote ancestors to mitochondria and plastids probably entered the host cell as undigested prey or internal parasites. The relationship between endosymbiont and host cells was mutually beneficial. Anaerobic host cells benefited from endosymbiont's ability to take advantage of an increasingly aerobic world. So as the world was changing because um, cyanobacteria, remember the stromatolites that form the stepping stones, in, uh, we still have them in Hamlin Bay in Australia, we described those in an earlier lecture, um, those began to change the atmosphere, um, so, so it in, incorporated more oxygen. And that oxygen was toxic to some of the prokaryotic uh, organisms living at the time. Well, organisms that were able to metabolize that oxygen were, were, were able to uh, survive and prosper. So anaerobic host cells those that were uh, adapted to low or no oxygen conditions benefited from endosymbiont's ability to take advantage of an incre increasingly aerobic world. This is kind of where mitochondria come from. Heterotrophic cells benefited from the nutrients produced by photosynthetic in endosymbionts. In the process of becoming more interdependent, the host uh, and endosymbionts would have become a single organism. Serial endosymbiosis supposes that mitochondria evolved before plastids through a series of endosymbiotic events. Okay, um, the proposed host was an archaeon or a cell descended from archaeal ancestors. The proposed ancestors of the mitochondria were aerobic, heterotrophic prokaryotes, whereas those of plastids were photosynthetic prokaryotes. In this feature, in this figure, the arrows represent the change over evolutionary time. Okay, so here you have the pr primitive ancestral prokaryote. This is some form of bacteria or archaea, and then uh, it began to develop a, a little mo bit more uh, complicated. Um, features, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, the ability to engulf um, its uh, neighboring uh, prokaryotes. Um, the nuclear envelope uh, was then evolved and then uh, bacteria were engulfed by this, uh, by this uh, prokaryote. And I mean we're talking about you know thousands and millions of years here that this is occurring. Um, so the mitochondrion became incorporated into the part of the of the of the cell, and then uh, in in some case, okay, so some became the ancestral heterotrophic eukaryote. These eventually became 
the cells that would become animal cells, and then uh, some of these incorporated photosynthetic bacterium, cyanobacteria, these became chloroplasts, and these chloroplasts or plastids here, identified as plastids, uh, they became ancestral photosynthetic eukaryotes. Okay, these gave rise to eventually to plants. So key evidence supporting the endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria and plastids. Inner membranes are similar to plasma membranes of prokaryotes. Division is similar to the, in these organelles and some prokaryotes. And DNA structure is similar to that of prokaryotes. Okay, so the DNA structure of these organelles, like the, the mitochondria and the, the chloroplasts or the plastids, uh, their, their DNA structure is more similar to that of prokaryotes than it is to eukaryotes. And they, uh, they go through cell division and all those processes uh, on their own clock. It's tied to the nuclear clock of, the, of each eukaryotic cell, but it's, but it's, uh, it's independent. These organelles transcribe and translate their own DNA. Their ribosomes are more similar to prokaryotic than to eukaryotic ribosomes. So their DNA structure is more similar to prokaryotes. Their organelles uh, transcribe and translate their own DNA independently. Uh, and their ribosomes are more similar to prokaryotic ribosomes than to eukaryotic ribosomes. The DNA sequence analysis indicates that mitochondria arose from an alpha proteobacterium. When we go back in your uh, notes in your textbook, um, and you can find uh, the description of the alpha proteobacterium. That's on page 472. Uh, eukaryotic mitochondria descended from a single common ancestor. Plastids arose from an engulfed cyanobacterium. Some photosynthetic protists may have been engulfed to become endosymbiotes themselves. The ancestral host cell may have been an archaean or a proto-eukaryote from, from a lineage related to but diverged from archaeal ancestors. There is now considerable evidence that much protist diversity has its origins in endosymbiosis. Mitochondria arose first through descent from bacterium that was engulfed by a cell in an archaeal lineage. The plastid lineage evolved later from a photosynthetic cyanobacterium that was engulfed by a heterotrophic uh, eukaryote. So these are uh, pretty much, these are accepted theories about how uh, eukaryotic cells evolved. They've pretty much worked out all the details on this. Okay, so here's a schematic diagram. Uh, you can find this on page 486. Um, it shows uh, 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 primitive uh, eukaryote. Uh, it's, it's engulfing a cyanobacterium. It benefits from the photosynthetic abilities of that uh, cyanobacterium. Um, it, there are two lineages that evolve from that, one in which the uh, heterotrophic eukaryote goes on further to consume a green algae. Uh, you know, a green algae is independent, uh, it's an independent protist, and as is a red algae, and then um, those, uh, the, the, tr the, uh, the organism, the eukaryote, engulfs the red algae, secondary endosymbiosis, and this yields to dinoflagellates, which are the progenitors of red tides, which can cause uh, a certain type of destruction in uh, coastal environments. They suck up all the oxygen in the water, and it, they kill a lot of fish. And uh, plastids are, are stromenophiles. Uh, green algae, basically what you need to know about the green algae is uh, they ultimately uh, wind up becoming... Uh, uh, the euglenids, and, uh, which are um, organisms that are capable of movement, and the, chloriano, the chlororhinocyanophytes, uh, which are, uh, these organisms are eventually find their way in the lineage of plants. 
Okay, so uh, studies of plastid-bearing eukaryotes suggest that plastids evolved from cyanobacterium that was engulfed by an ancestral heterotrophic eukaryote, primary endosymbiosis. That ancestor would then diversified into red algae and green algae, some of which were success subsequently engulfed by other eukaryotes. Okay, secondary endosymbiosis. So that's primary endosymbiosis and secondary endosymbiosis. The plastid bearing lineage of protists evolved into red and green algae. Like cyanobacteria, plastids of red algae and green algae have two membranes. Transport proteins in the membranes of red and green algae are homologous to those found in cyanobacteria. On several occasions during eukaryotic evolution, red and green algae underwent secondary endosymbiosis and in which they were ingested by heterotrophic eukarya. Multicellularity has originated several times in eukaryotes. The evolution of eukaryotic cells allowed for greater range in unicellular forms. A second wave of diversification occurred when, when multicellularity evolved and gave rise to algae, plants, fungi, and animals. So all of this is part of the evolutionary pathway um, that uh, leads to you eventually. The first multicellular forms were colonies, collections of cells that are collected to one another, connected to one another, but showed little or no cellular differentiation. Multicellular colonies consist of simple filaments, balls, or cell sheets. Colonial cells may be attached by shared cell walls or in cells that lack rigid walls, they can be held together by proteins that physically connect and adjoin adjacent cells. Here is a pediastrum. It's a photosynthetic eukaryote that uh, forms flat colonies. Um, so these just kind of float around in fresh water and um, they are uh, progenitors of uh, the green algaes, green algae uh, co colonial organisms. Multicellular organisms with differentiated cells originated multiple times over the course of eukaryotic evolution. Genetic and morphological evidence indicates that lineages of red, green, and brown algae, plants, fungi, and animals arose independently from different single-celled an ancestors. We're going to try to understand that throughout the course of this chapter. Volvox is a multicellular green algae that forms a monophyletic group with a single-celled algae called Chlamydomonas, a, a several and several colonial species. Volvox and all the colonial members of this group pro, have proteins homologous to those found in the cell wall of Chlamydomonas. Multicellularity in Volvox may have originated through evolution of increasingly complex colonial forms descended from a single-celled common ancestor. Okay, so this is how we're getting um, uh, multicellularity into organisms. Chlamydomonas cell wall has a, both an outer wall that's in gray and an inner wall that's in yellow here. Gonium cells, gonium, which is the next most complicated related organism, uh, cells represent the Chlamydomonas cells and the structure that attach the gonium cells to one another contain proteins homologous to those in the Chlamydomonas cell wall. In Pandorina and Volvox, the cells are embedded in an extracellular ma matrix containing proteins that are homologous to those found in the Chlamydomonas inner wall. So e even you're getting, you're getting these related, more complex uh, genus out of uh, the similar Chlamydomonas. So we can see the relationship of the phylogenetic tree here 
through the type of protein that is used to bind the, uh, the cells, the individual cells together. Only a few novel genes account for morphological differences between bulbix and Chlamydomonas. The transition to multicellularity can, may result from changes in how existing genes are used rather than in the origin of large numbers of novel genes. Okay, steps in the multicellularity of animals. Choanoflagellates are the closest living relatives of animals. The common ancestor of choanoflagellates and living animals may have resembled present-day choanoflagellates. So these organisms still exist today. They're like a, uh, a remnant organism, a, uh, a fossil a holdover from the past. Okay, here are, um, it, it, you may not think of it this way, but sponges are actually the most primitive uh, animals. And uh, choanoflagellates are prokaryotes that are very closely related to sponges. But choanoflagellates form little colonies, but they're not as, uh, as structured as sponges. When you take a look at this, uh, the sponges, um, co the collar cell, the cell in the sponge that's dedicated to moving water through the sponge, you have... Um, you have a, a great similarity to the choanoflagellate. Okay, these cells are even called choanocytes to indicate their similarity to the choanoflagellate. You take a look at them, they're almost identical. Uh, they've just got a, you know, it's just, if you took this collar cell out, you could, um, this, this could be its, uh, its own organism. In fact, you can break a sponge apart and strain it through a strainer and it will reassemble itself. These are, the choanocytes are almost like independent organisms, but they always reform into, a, into the sponge organism. These choanoflagellates, very similar. Okay, sponges, the most primitive animals. This is a very simple phylogenetic tree. Um, other animals include the cnidarians, all right, everything all the way up to primates and human beings. The origin of multicellularity in animals required mechanisms for cells to adhere to each other and to communicate with each other, and this is known as cell signaling. So within the cells, uh, multicellularity developed, um, cells had to be able to signal one another. This is like in the sponge, how it's able to reassemble itself. Um, uh, there are different types of cells within the sponge, cells that give it structure, cells that uh, move the, that pump the water through the sponge, cells that uh, sequester the food items. Uh, these cells all communicate with each other through the process of cell signaling. Molecular similarities in domains of proteins functioning in cell adherence uh, called cadherons are, and cell signaling have been found between modern choanoflagellates and representative man, uh, animals. <clears throat> so there are similarities between the chemical structure of uh, cadherins and, um, and modern cell, cell signaling molecules. Okay, here we have uh, an example of that. This, this uh, graph shows, or this uh, item here shows uh, cadherin proteins in choanoflagellates, and animals. The uh, ancestral cadarin-like protein of choanoflagellates has seven domains or regions, each represented here by a, a particular sy symbol. With the exception of the CCD remain r domain, which you see here in red on the animal section, um, most of the rest of that, uh, which is found only in animals, the domains of animal cadarin proteins are present in the choanoflagellate cadirin-like protein. The cadirin protein domains show here that were identified from the whole genome sequence data. Evolutionary relationships are based on morphological and DNA sequence data. So there's morphological uh, similarity between the choanoflagellates and the sponges. 
and there's uh, these uh, molecular or protein similarities uh, between these cadarin proteins and uh, choanoflagellates and animals. The transition to multicellularity in animals involved new ways of using proteins encoded by genes found in choanoflagellates rather than the evolution of many novel genes. Four supergroups of eukaryotes have been proposed based on morphological and molecular data. This is easier said than done. Um, new information comes out, uh, these cladistic understandings uh, sometimes change. But right now, this is the current understanding. Eukaryote diver diversity is influenced by their hybrid origins and the independent origins of complex multicellularity. One hypothesis divides all eukaryotes into four supergroups. The four supergroups of eukaryotes. It is no longer thought that the A mitochondriates, lacking mitochondria, A signifying the lack, A mitochondriates, lacking mitochondria, are the oldest lineages of eukaryotes. Many have been shown to have mitochondria and have been reclassified. So some A mitochondriates actually had uh, like some form of a mitochondria that, that was overlooked uh, or it was a, a different type of organelle that's now being classified as a mitochondria. Our understanding of the relationships among protist groups continues to change rapidly. One hypothesis divides all eukaryotes, including protists, into four supergroups. Okay, uh, if you want to, I'm going to include the PowerPoint along with each one of these lectures in your Blackboard file. Uh, you can go to your PowerPoint and you can see these uh, videos. They'll show you the amoeba, um, the Volvox. I recommend looking at the Volvox colony. Uh, it's a very interesting organism. I think we might have a picture of it for, uh, later on in this lecture, but uh, you should just check it out. It's pretty interesting. Okay, so here are the four supergroups of eukaryotes. Uh, we're going to go through this in greater detail, but since we have this overview here, I want to point out some things. Okay, here are the excavata. Um, this includes the um, um, G, uh, organisms like parasites such as Giardia. Uh, Giardia is a uh, parasite that gets in your water supply. Um, if you uh, have a uh, tainted water supply, you can easily get rid of Giardia by boiling the water. Okay, that's something to remember. So you can boil the water to get rid of the Giardia. Um, that's the Excavata clan. It's called Excavata because it's got like a little, it's got a little area. It looks like it's carved out underneath it. It has a little hollow uh, in the underside. Many of the protists that fit into this clade uh, have fit that description. Uh, then there are the uh, Archaeoplastida. Um, oh, well, let me go according to this chart here. Then there's the Sarclade. Um, the Sarclade includes diatoms, brown algae, dinoflagellates, that's the red tide, uh, APO, AP complexans, ciliates, forams. Uh, uh, foraminifera are uh, these organisms here. They're basically anebas that have a... Um, calcareous shell, uh, and they're very tiny. They're not quite uh, microscopic, but they're close. And you can see here the uh, pseudopods are reaching out throughout the shell of the uh, amoeba. Um, then there's the Archaeoplastida. The Archaeoplastida includes Volvox. This is the colonial protist here, the plant that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you want to try to check out the video of the Volvox. Um, it, it has a col <clears throat> colonial uh, organism inside these, these little green organisms here. Uh, these are like the baby Volvox. And then eventually the shell ruptures and those other baby Volvox will pass out and become uh, uh, adult Volvox. So it's a really interesting life cycle for the, for the organism. Okay, here's the... Um, Remember, we were talking about Chlamydomonas and the uh, way that it's uh, that these proteins um, can hold together those uh, those similar types of uh, 
colonial organisms. Okay, um, so the SAR clade uh, diatoms, they're really cool. You, these are like a sample of diatoms. They're made out of silica, and uh, they, they suck up a lot of carbon dioxide in the ocean. So um, diatoms can... Uh, in they they like use a lot of carbon dioxide in the process of their life cycle and then they die and they sink to the bottom of the ocean and two things happen that forms a carbon sink which it removes carbon dioxide dioxide from the atmosphere and it also uh it allows um uh, ultimately uh petroleum the basis of petroleum is is uh mostly uh diatoms so a lot of like the, uh, o when they're drilling ocean uh, petroleum, a lot of that is uh, diatoms that have uh, been processed and compressed over millions of years. Okay, the Unicanta, okay, these includes the um, uh, <clears throat> amoebas, the slime moles, we'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, I want you to, it's, I'm, I'm going to point this out, let me, uh, before I get too confused here, let, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so here's shows the slide. These dotted lines here show relationships that are unclear. Remember how I told you how uh, the cladistic understanding of these organisms is not always certain? Well, that's what this these dotted lines represent. They're not. We're not exactly certain, but this is our best best guess. Okay, so. Um, Something that's interesting to note here is we look at the at the protists here. The archaeoplastids includes the cherophytes, uh, the green algae, and ultimately these give rise to the land plants. So land plants come from protists. Um, here, the nuclearids and the uh, come from the same lineage as the the fungi. So fungi, mushrooms come come from uh, the unicanta. Uh, animals also come from the Unicanta, and uh, these are, uh, they share, uh, pl uh, it's interesting to note here because fungi and animals share uh, greater s ancestral similarity than fungi and plants. So fungi and plants are related, their common ancestor is way back here, and fungi and animals' common ancestor is up here. So they're mo more closely related. So these protists here gave rise, like everything that you think of, animals, you know, puppy dogs, uh, polar bears, human beings, uh, mushrooms, trees, all these things rise out of the protists. Okay, to get a greater understanding of this, I want you to look on page uh, 490 in your textbook. Okay, here's Giardia, the intestinal parasite. Diatom diversity, there's quite a diversity of diatom. Usually diatoms are formed of two tests or two matching forms that uh, fit together kind of like a Petri dish. And... Um, they have like a, a myriad different forms. They're really spectacular organisms. Remember, these are the guys that ultimately, when they die and sink to the bottom of the ocean, they take the carbon dioxide with them, they form a carbon sink, and they ultimately form the basis of petroleum. Okay, here's Globigerina. It's a foraminifera, uh, Rhizarian from the SAR supergroup. Um, Whoa, wait a second here. Yeah, okay, so uh, these are like, inside this uh, little calcareous test lives the, um, lives uh, like an amoeba, and these are like the little legs or pseudopods of the amoeba that are extending outside of the foraminifera. Now what's interesting is there are some beaches on the earth, uh, maybe some of you have been there, they call them, they say they have singing sands, like when you walk on the beach, it makes like a little uh, uh, kind of squeaking noise. 
And um, these singing sands are largely made of foraminiferal tests, foraminiferal outer coverings. The forams die and they wash up on the beach. And if you pick up a handful of that sand and look at it, this is this the the sand that you have in Virginia Beach is quartz. It's mineral sand. It's not like this. But in some beaches in some places of the world, maybe some of you know you've been to these places. They have these beaches. The the sand is formed of these foraminifera. They're like these little round balls. The sand looks different than the mineral sand that we're used to. Here's Volvox, the multicellular green algae. This is a unicont, an amoeba. This is the lineage that eventually led to uh, animals. Okay, amoebas, we're all kind of familiar with amoebas. They they uh, have the ability to move by stretching out their pseudopods. They respond to chemical cues in their environment. They can move towards food items and they wrap around. They wrap themselves around the food items and engulf them, and then uh, consume those food items. That's kind of like endosymbiosis. Like if they, if they, if this amoeba wrapped itself around that, um, <clears throat> that uh, chlorophytic. Uh, protist right there in the in the corner there and then it did not digest it then that could be the beginning of endosymbiosis the supergroup excavata is characterized by its cytoskeleton some members have a feeding groove this monophyletic group includes the diplomonads parabasalids and euclinosians Okay, I'm not going to ask you to uh, remember this level of detail, but I do want you to know uh, some of the overarching concepts that we're talking about here. So some of the main characters, Excavata, Sarclade, Archaeoplastida, Unicanta, need to know those. Diplomonads and Parabasalids. These two groups lack plastids. They have modified mitochondria and most live in anaerobic environments. Diplomonads have reduced mitochondrial called mitosomes. They derive energy from aerobic, anaerobic biochemical pathways. Often they are parasites, for example, Giardia intestinalis, and they may use using they may move using simple flagella. Parabasalids have reduced mitochondria called hy hydrogenosomes that generate some energy anaerobically. They include trich trichomonas vaginalis, a sexually transmitted uh, parasite. Uh, this is a parasite that affects. Uh, Females uh, more than males. Uh, males are capable of transmitting this parasite, but in females it causes uh, irritation, and it's uh, basically a big problem. You have to get it. Uh, you have to get it treated right away. Okay, here's the Trichomonas vaginalis. Um, it has an undulating membrane, so it's uh, it's a protist that's capable of movement on its own. It's it's able to swim around. It's got flagella to help it move as well. So uh, it's a it's a it's a one-celled organism. Uh, it doesn't have any plastids. It's not uh, photosynthetic, but it, it it does have mitochondria. It does have a nucleus. Um, it's it's um, it's simple, relatively speaking, but it's more complex organism. It's a eukaryote. So that's what we're talking about today. Euglenosia is a diverse clade that includes predatory heterotrophs, photosynthetic autotrophs, and parasites. So it's a clade that we just kind of put a lot of things into. The main feature distinguishing them as a clade is a spiral or crystalline rod inside their flagella. Okay, so this is a structural adaptation 
that distinguishes the, these clay. This clay includes euglenids and kinetoplastids. Okay, here's a euglenosium flagellum uh, right here. They cut it across the cross section. Um, it, here's a uh, x-ray crystal micro microscopy. Uh, it shows the uh, ring of microtubules right here in this circle here. And then a crystalline rod. Uh, this is the cross section here. So it's part of the structure of the euglenoids. Euglenids have one or two flagella that emerge from a pocket at one end of the cell. Some species can be both autotrophic or heterotrophic. Kinetoplastids have a single mitochondrion with an organized mass of DNA called the kinetoplast. They include free living consumers of prokaryotes in aquatic ecosystems and parasites of animals, plants, and other protists. These include trypanosoma, the organism which causes sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness is uh, transmitted by um, the tsetse fly, uh, which is a biting fly that lives in Africa, and it, uh, it can transmit the trypanosoma protists into the human being, uh, the human where the um, trypanosoma affects the um, affects the bloodstream of the human and, uh, and it, affects, uh, it affects the neural pathways of the victim and it causes the person to become excessively sleepy and basically spends a lot of time sleeping. Uh, it's a very dangerous um, disease. Um, it's a neurological disease and it is invariably fatal if not treated. Okay, here's the trypanosoma uh, kinetoplastid that causes sleeping sickness. The sarclade is a diverse monophyletic group named for the first letters of its major clades. Straminophiles, alveolates, and rhizarians. Okay, so here are the sarclade. We're moving down, making our way through. Diatoms, brown algae, dinoflagellates, apicomplexons, ciliates, forams, and circozoans, straminophiles, alveolites, and rhizarians. The subgroup straminophiles includes the most important photosynthetic organisms on Earth. Diatoms and brown algae are members of the straminophiles clade. Diatoms are highly diverse unicellular algae with unique two-part glass wall that is made of silicon dioxide. Okay, here's the diatom Triceratium morlandi. Um, it's just uh, it's an illustration of the complexity and the amazing nature of this organism. It's very tiny, 40 microns. It's microscopic cannot see it with the naked eye. Brown algae are the most are the largest and most complex algae. All are multicellular and most are marine. Brown algae includes many uh, species commonly called seaweeds. Brown algae seaweeds have plant-like structures and root-like holdfasts which anchors the algae and and a stem-like stipe which supports the leaf-like blades. So it has a multicellular structure and it has um, and it and it has a similarity in appearance to a plant. Similarities between algae and plants are examples of analogous structures. Okay, so uh, it evolved distinctly like convergent evolution um, analogous structures, the holdfast, uh, it's not really getting nutrients from the holdfast, it's just uh, securing its location. The stipe is like the trunk of the plant and the blade is like the leaves, but they're uh, evolved completely separately. Alveolates are a subgroup of the sarclade that have 
membrane bounded sacs, alveoli, that is just under the plasma membrane. Dinoflagellates and ciliates are members of the alveolata clade. Okay, so here's a uh, dinoflagellate. Um, it shows the um, flagellum here, and then just under the uh, surface of the organism here are alveoli, little air pockets. Remember, does everybody remember what the alveoli of the lungs are? They're the little air bags in the, in the lungs that hold air and transfer it to the capillary. So alveoli are small pockets of air. That's um, in these protists, they have uh, little alveoli that gives them their name, the alveoli. Dinoflagellates have two flagella and each cell is reinforced by cellulose plates. They are abundant components of both marine and freshwater phytoplankton. They are diverse forms of aquatic phototrophs, mixotrophs, and heterotrophs. Toxic red tides are caused by dinoflagellate blooms. In, uh, under certain conditions, like if a lot of um, uh, nutrients are washed into the uh, coastal waterways, this happens uh, with relative frequency in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. It sometimes happens uh, on the eastern shore as well, like in the, uh, on, the, on the Atlantic coastline. Uh, these nutrients can uh, in, increase the amount of dinoflagellates and cause what's known as a bloom, which is uh, uh, an in, uh, increased reproductive capacity of the dinoflagellates, and they can um, excrete toxins and use up uh, lots of oxygen in the environment, in the aquatic environment, and that can lead to uh, the deaths of fish in that area. So red ties cause fish kills. Okay, here's Fisteria shumwe, a dinoflagellate. Uh, Fisteria is another type of um, dinoflagellate that affects fish. It causes um, lesions on the fish. If any of you uh, do any fishing, uh, you might know about Fisteria already. It's an organism that, uh, that appears in the fish population from time to time. Uh, by making itself known by causing lesions on the fish. Ciliates are a large, varied group of protists, and they are named for their use of cilia to move and feed. Most ciliates are predators of bacteria or small protists. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to talk about the paramecium's. The paramecium's. Um, it's a it's really cool protist. It's got uh, complex um, uh, body form. Uh, you know, it has uh, it has two nuclei, a macronucleus and a micronucleus. Um, the paramecium constantly takes in water by osmosis from its hypotomic environment. The bladder-like contractile vacuoles accumulate excess water from the radial canals and periodically expel it through the plasma membrane. Cilia along a funnel-shaped oil groove move food, mainly bacteria, into the cell mouth, where the food is engulfed into food vacuoles by phagocytosis. Food vacuoles fuse with lysosomes, not shown here. As the food is digested, the vacuoles follow a looping path through the cell. Wastes are released when the vacuoles fuse with a specialized region of the plasma membrane that functions as an anal pore. Thousands of cilia color, color, color the surface of the paramecium. So we're starting to get into more complex uh, uh, eukaryotes here. Okay. Here's an image of a paramecium. There's this contractile vacuole helps to control uh, water in its environment. Okay, rhizarians. Now, many species of rhizarians are amoebas. Amoebas move and feed by pseudopodia. Some, some but not all belong to the clade rhizaria. Foraminiferas and cercozoans are members of the rhizarian clade. <clears throat> so they, the amoebas are pretty interesting organisms. Foraminiferas 
are the are named for the porous shells called tests. We describe those in detail. We talk about how the foraminiferal test becomes the basis for uh, sand on certain beaches throughout the world. I think in the Caribbean you can find some beaches like this. Um, pseudopodia extend through the pores in the test, and many forams have endosymbiotic algae. They're capable of um, they're capable of uh, maintaining the benefits of photosynthesis. Even though they themselves are not photosynthetic, they have these endosymbiotic uh, algae. Foraminifera include both marine and freshwater species. Circozoans include amoeboid and flagellated protists with thread-like pseudopodia. They are common in marine, freshwater, and soil ecosystems. Most are heterotrophs, including parasites and predators. Paulinella chromatophora is an autotroph with unique photosynthetic structure called the chromatophore. The structure evolved from a different cyanobacterium than the plastids of, of other photosynthetic eukaryotes. Okay, so this has a whole different uh, lineage. It's a photosynthetic organism, but it's, it's got this chromatophore which is evolved separately. The, the circozoan pollinella conducts photosynthesis in a unique sausage-shaped structure called the chromatophore. Chromatophores are surrounded by a membrane with a peptidoglycan layer, suggesting that they are derived from bacterium. DNA evidence suggests that chromatophores are derived from a different cyanobacterium than from which other plastids are derived. So these are a distinct evolutionary lineage from the lineage that eventually gave rise to plants. Plastids arose when heterotrophic protists acquired cyanobacterial endosymbia. The photosynthetic descendants of this ancient protist evolved into red algae and green algae. Land plants are descended from the green algae. Archaeoplastida is the group that, that includes red algae, green algae, and land plants. Red algae are reddish in color due to the accessory pigment called phycoerythrin. Which, makes, which masks the green of chlorophyll. The color varies from greenish red in shallow water to dark red in, or almost black in deep water. Red algae are usually multicellular and the largest are seaweeds. Red algae are the most abundant large algae in the coastal waters of the tropics. They reproduce sexually. Okay, these are some of the uh, common red algaes. Uh, Bonamesonia hemifera is a very uh, elegant red algae, and uh, the red algae uh, that gives us nori, which is the seaweed that we wrap sushi in. I'm, I don't know if everybody's familiar with sushi, but it's a Japanese delicacy. Uh, there are many sushi restaurants available here in the Richmond area. Uh, some of them are pretty good, and they uh, generally uh, you have uh, sushi is wrapped up by by this nori seaweed, which they dry on racks like this. This is all nori seaweed being dried on, on, on racks. And then uh, once it's dried, it's, it's uh, wrapped around these uh, rice and raw fish um, balls of, of food. <clears throat> Green algae are named for their grass green chloroplasts. Plants are descended from the green algae. Green algae are a paraphyletic group. The two main groups are charophytes and chlorophytes. Charophytes are most closely related to land plants. We're going to talk about charophytes in a little more detail. Most chlorophytes live in fresh water, although many are marine and some are terrestrial. Nearly all species of chlorophytes reproduce sexually. Some unicellular chlorophytes are free-living, 
while others are symbiotically live symbiotically within other eukaryotes. Larger size and greater complexity are found in the multicellular species including Volvox and Ulva. Ulva is also known as sea lettuce. Uh, it, I, I wouldn't, it's, uh, it's a, um, it's an algae that is uh, common in the in uh, the Virginia area. It, it's uh, it's found all throughout the world. It's very common. It's actually edible. Uh, you can eat it. I I wouldn't recommend eating it in a bay because there's uh, too much. It collects too much pollutants. But uh, on the on on this, if you go to the ocean, like if you go to a secluded seashore and you find some sea lettuce. You, you can eat it. It's not going to hurt hurt you. Um, you know, if you're like Bear Gryllis or something, and you're stuck out there and you have to survive, it's good to know that Ulva or sea lettuce is is out there. Um, sea lettuce is also an indicator of pollution. If you have a lot of sea lettuce, like sometimes you'll find a lot of sea lettuce in a in a bay or a marina, it indicates that there's a lot of nitrogen going into that environment. Uh, that, that's usually effluent from uh, uh, from uh, agricultural waste like uh, fertilizers and whatnot, and uh, that can that can increase the uh, amount of sea lettuce in an area. There's also uh, calarpa and uh, intertidal chlorophyte. Um, this is less common here on the east coast. The supergroup unit known as Uniconta includes animals, fungi, and some protists. This group includes two clades, the amoebozoans and the opistocons, which includes the animals, fungi, and related protists. The root of the eukaryotic tree remains controversial. It's unclear whether unicots separated from other eukaryotes or relatively early or relatively late. Okay, here's the unicots. It's the last of our supergroups of protists. Uh, gymnamoebas, slime molds, nuclearids, fungi, coanoflagellates, and animals. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'm not sure why we're looking at this. Let's see. Um, okay, this is just to try to understand uh, what the common ancestor of all eukaryotes is and where the unicons fit in on that, um, on that uh, phylogenetic tree. Uh, there's all kinds of information that goes into this. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to worry about it too much if you want to. On page 497, you can find the section inquiry, where is the ute of the eukaryotic tree, and you can investigate this a little more detail. Amoebozoans are like amoebas that have a lobe or tube shaped rather than thread-like thread -like pseudopodia. Most amoebozoans are free living, but those that belong to the genus Entamoeba are parasites. Slime molds are free-living amoebozoans that were once thought to be fungi. DNA sequence and analyses, analysis indicate that slime molds belong to the clade amoebozoa. These guys have a fascinating life history. Dicostylium is an example of a cellular slime mold. Cellular slime molds consist of solitary cells that move individually but can aggregate to form a fruiting body. Slime molds actually move and they know where each other are. They can relate to cues, chemical cues in their environment. If you break apart a slime mold into separate sections, it can find its way back together. And when it does find its way back together, it can form it can form a fruiting structure that basically it's like a it disperses spores and the causes uh, and it allows it to uh, disperse throughout its environment. Okay. The in the feeding stage, the solitary. Okay, this is up at the top here. Um, in the feeding stage, the solitary haploid amoebas engulf bacteria. 
Then during sexual reproduction, two of the amoebas fuse to, fo to form a zygote. So these two amoebas form, they form a, a, a diploid zygote. The zygote becomes a giant cell by consuming haploid amoebas. After, after developing a resistant wall, the giant cell undergoes meiosis followed by several meiotic, mitotic divisions. The cell wall ruptures and releasing, releasing the new amoebas. When, when the food, okay, here's the aggregated amoebas down here. When food is depleted, hundreds of uh, amoebas congregate in response to a chemical attractant and form a slug-like aggregate. That's the, that's the aggregate down here. It looks, looks like it's, its own organism but it's actually a, col a colony. Uh, the aggregate migrates for a while and then stops. Some of the cells dry up, dry up and after forming a stalk that supports an asexual fruiting body. The other cells crawl up the stalk and develop into spores. They crawl, uh, see, so it forms a stalk and then the other cells crawl up that stalk and form uh, spores. These spores are released and in favorable conditions, amoebas emerge from the spore coats and begin to feed and then start the process all over again. So these are uh, they're simple, one-celled organisms, but they have a life history that suggests that they have a, a more, they're, that they're more complex. Opistocons include animals, fungi, and several groups of protists. Single-celled eukaryotes play key roles in ecological communities and affect human health. The majority of eukaryotic lineages are composed of protists. Protists in exhibit a wider range of structural and functional diversity. Single-celled protists can be very complex. All biological functions are carried out by organelles in each individual cell. Protists are found in diverse aquatic environments. Some protists reproduce asexually, while others reproduce sexually or by the sexual processes of meiosis and fertilization. Protists show a wide range of nutritional diversity, including photoautotrophs, which contain chloroplasts, heterotrophs which absorb organic molecules or ingest larger food particles, and mixotrophs which combine photosynthesis and heterotrophic nutrition. Many protists are important producers that obtain energy from the sun. In aquatic environments, photosynthetic protists and prokaryotes are the main producers. In aquatic environments, photosynthetic protists are limited by nutrients. These populations can explode when limiting nutrients are added. Remember I told you about the nit nitrogen deposition that can come from uh, fertilizers and uh, re find its way into the bay, and that will increase the amount of sea lettuce, the, the green algae sea lettuce. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. The similar thing happens with the dinoflagellates with the red tide. Okay, increase the red tide population. Okay, so... Uh, Single-celled eukaryotes play key roles in the ecological communities that affect human health, that affect the health of all organisms. Okay, so they basically they form uh, the basis of the food chain. So the, here are the protistin uh, pro producers, uh, diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates, uh, other organisms, uh, the prokaryotic producers, the bacteria, some archaea in extreme situations. Uh, these are all consumed by uh, the 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 uh, photosynthetic uh, producers are consumed by herbivorous plankton, and herbivorous plankton are consumed by uh, carnivorous plankton. Those carnivorous plankton are in turn in turn consumed by um, organisms like shrimp or krill. Uh, those krill are eaten by fish. Those fish are eaten by uh, 
penguins, and the penguins are eaten by killer whales. Okay, so all of this uh, th would collapse if it weren't for the protistin producers and the prokaryotic producers. So all the whole ecosystem depends on these organisms. Diatoms are a major component of phytoplankton. After a diatom population has bloomed, many dead individuals fall to the floor undecomposed. This removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and pumps it into the ocean floor. When biomass and growth of photosynthetic protists and prokaryotes have declined as sea surface temperatures has increased, warmer, warmer surface temperatures may prevent nutrient upwelling a critical process to the growth of marine pr producers. <clears throat> if sea surface temperatures continue to warm to global warming, this could have effects on marine ecosystems, fishery yields, and global carbon cycle. So if you're getting a reduced amount of... Um, this, is a, this shows a sea, sea surface temperatures... Uh, uh, change over a period of 50 years from the 1950s to 2000s. Uh, you can see that it's uh, basically uh, if it's yellow to orange in the warm color range, uh, it indicates that that, that that water is warming over that 50 year period. Um, here are some few areas where that that the water uh, temperature is cooling over during that same period, but uh, for the most part, in the largest parts of the ocean, the water temperature is warming. Okay, in all these different uh, areas, they measured a chlorophyll change um, <clears throat> with similar techniques. Um, this indicates that these uh, these are having negative chlorophyll chains in all these oceans, Arctic, North Atlantic, Equatorial Atlantic. Okay, the only uh, in oceans that are having increased uh, chlorophyll change are the uh, North Atlantic and South, the, the North Indian and South Indian Ocean. Let's look at them. Okay, the North Indian and South Indian Ocean, that's, that's here and here. In these regions here, there's an increase in chlorophyll activity. Okay, for the most part, chlorophyll change is decreasing over time. So if, if chlorophyll is decreasing, this means that the overall productivity of the ecosystem is decreasing. It should decrease uh, the uh, primary producers, the secondary consumers. Um, it, it should generally wind up in a decrease in fisheries. Some symbionts benefit their hosts. Dinoflagellates nourish coral polyps in, that build reefs. I don't know if any of you have been uh, scuba diving, but when you look at uh, coral reefs, there are uh, several different colors, and those colors are caused by the dinoflagellates, uh, the, the uh, algae known as zooxanthellae. Uh, the zooxanthellae lives in uh, the coral in a symbiotic relationship, and it, um, it, it's photosynthetic, and it helps the coral polyps uh, to uh, metabolize um, uh, bicarbonate and to uh, build the structure of the reefs. Uh, wood digesting protists digest cellulose in the guts of termites and, uh, and roaches. So there are protists that uh, are symbiotic in the, in the guts of, um, of uh, termites, and that's basically the reason that they can destroy your house is because they have this. Without this protist, they wouldn't be able to digest that cellulose. Here's a uh, here is the endosymbiont of the pro, of the uh, pe, of the termite. This organism is a hypermastigote. It's a member of the parabasalids that live in the gut of termites and certain cockroaches, and it enables the, the host to digest wood. Some protists are parasitic. Plasmodium causes malaria. Visteria shumway is a diaflagellate that, cause, that causes fish kills. We talked about that. It's the, it's the uh, dinoflagellate that causes the lesions and causes the fish kills. Uh, Phytophora remorium causes so, sudden oak death. Uh, Phytophora infestans and causes potato late blight. Phytophora infestans is why 
there's so many Irish people in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, the potato blight struck the um, struck the Ireland about the middle of the 1800s, um, and it, uh, it the people had come to rely on potatoes in Ireland, and uh, they only they only grew one strain of potato. There are men, there's over a thousand different strains of potatoes, but they only grew one strain. It was the strain that grew best in that environment. And they grew this potato, and then it was stricken by this blight. Phytophoria infestans decimated the potatoes, and it caused us massive starvation in the population, and it led to the emigration of those people where they immigrated into, uh, into the United States, typically in the New England region, but also all around the country. But, um, so Phytophoria infestans caused the potato blight. Potato blight made the Irish leave Ireland, and then that's why we have so many Irish uh, in, in the New England area. Protists that cause infectious disease can pose major challenges to human immune systems and public health. Trypanosoma is, a, in fact, is an excavate that causes sleeping sickness in, in humans. Sleeping sickness, we talk about this, it's transferred, transmitted by the tsetse fly, um, it gets, uh, if the CC fly bites someone, it gets into your bloodstream, uh, eventually it affects your, uh, your uh, neural pathways and your brain and it, can, and it causes you to, be go, to become uh, extremely sleepy all the time and is eventually fatal if untreated. Trypanosomes evade immune response by switching surface proteins. A cell produces millions of copies of a single protein. The new generation produces millions of copies of a different protein. So these frequent changes in the proteins uh, of the cell surface prevent the host from developing an immunity to the trypanosome. Entamoebas are amoeba parasites of vertebrates and some invertebrates. Entamoeba histolytica causes amoebic dysentery. It's the third leading, leading cause of human death. Uh, to due to eukaryotic parasites, um, it basically causes uh, acute diarrhea, and you and it makes you lose all of your uh, water, and it uh, it drains you of your water resources, and that leads uh, to death. So uh, it, it can be treated if you get amoebic dysentery. If you keep up with your electrolytes and keep drinking lots of water. Uh, it can it can be treated, but it's also very frequent that it it yields to death, especially in the developing world. Um, <clears throat> amoebic dysentery. You can also treat your water by boiling it, just like Giardia. So you want to boil your water if you're in a in a situation where you are not certain about the quality of the water that you're drinking. Always boil your water. AB complexins are alveolate parasi parasites that, of animals and some cause serious human diseases. Most have sexual and asexual stages that require two or more different hosts for, speech for species. Oh, you, you can require more than one host for species uh, com life cycle completion. Apio Apicomplexin plasmodian is the parasite that causes malaria. Plasmodium requires both mosquitoes and humans to complete its life cycle. Approximately 900,000 people die each year from malaria. Efforts ongoing to develop vaccines that target this pathogen. One of the most effective ways of combating, of combating malaria is using a mosquito net. And it's also very, efficient, it's very um, affordable. So a lot of organizations that are combating malaria deaths in the developing world are just buying uh, mosquito nets so people can have mosquito nets over their bed uh, when they sleep and that reduces the amount of uh, malaria. Okay, here we have uh, an example of the malaria life cycle. Uh, uh, we'll start up at the top here where it shows uh, the mosquito is biting a person right here. Um, An infected Anopheles mosquito bites a person, injecting the plasmodium sporocyte where it has in it its saliva. 
The plasmodium sporocyte is tiny and it lives in the salivary glands of the mosquito. When the mosquito bites a person, it um, excretes a little bit of saliva to help it to fit its proboscis into the, into the skin of the person. And that saliva is actually what causes the, the itching sensation um, from a mosquito bite. The sporozytes enter the person's liver cells and after several days, the sporozytes undergo multiple divisions and become merozytes, which, they're, which use their apical complex to penetrate the red blood cells. Okay, so these merozytes, uh, they... The the the, um, the the sporozytes get into the liver, and then from the liver tissue they develop they evolve into merozytes, and the merozytes go into the blood cells, and then the the uh, blood cells are ruptured by the by the um, by the merozytes, and they do this on a it's uh, on a cycle of like every forty eight to seventy two hours, and uh, that's what causes the chills and the fever uh, that's uh, known to uh, accompany malaria. So if you've ever seen a movie of, about, of a guy that's afflicted with malaria, he's always undergoing chills and fever, chills and fever in these cycles. It's because these merozytes are rupturing these red blood cells in their, in their body. The merozytes divide asexually inside the red blood cells at intervals of 48 to 72 hours, depending on the species, large numbers of merozytes break out of the blood cells, causing periodic chills and fever. Some of the merozytes infect other red blood cells. Some merozytes go on to form gametocytes. If another Anopheles mosquito bites the infected person, it picks up the plasmodian gametocytes along with the blood. The, gam the gametes form the gametocytes, and each male gametocyte produces several slender male gametes. Fertilization occurs in the mosquito's digestive tract and a zygote forms. So this is why the, the, uh, uh, the malaria protist requires both the human and the mosquito for its life cycle. The oocyte develops from, the, from a zygote in the wall of the mosquito's gut. The the oocyte releases thousands of sporozytes which migrate into the mosquito's salivary gland. So here's the life cycle. Okay, here's the oocytes, crea creates the sporozytes, the spores, diploid sporocytes, <clears throat> that haploid sporozytes transfer from the mosquito into the, into the person, into the liver, the liver to the blood, the blood to the the blood to the gametocytes, the gametocytes transfer to the next mosquito, um, the haploid uh, gametes form a slender, uh, slender gametes, these gametes, okay, right, they form a union with the uh, female st uh, st structure, fertilize, create a zygote, the zygote bursts and creates the, gives birth to the sporozytes and then the cycle continues. Here's a, a, the merozytes. This is a, this is a um, electron scanning micrograph of a, of a malarial merozyte. Okay, here is, uh, this is like um, a table of, uh, that shows a matrix table that shows um, how uh, prokaryotes are related to eukaryotes. It shows the, um, the mitochondrion of a, of a wheat. Okay, in this matrix, all right, we show the wheat mitochondrion is related to the wheat mitochondrion. We know that, so it gets a dash right there. Um, this is um, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It's a bacteria that uh, affects uh, plants. It causes little nodules in the plants and like an, it infects those plants. Um, it's, it's, uh, it has uh, these numbers, these values here are, per the, are percent of relatedness. 
So this uh, agrobacterium is 48% related to the wheat mitochondria. These other bacteria have different life cycles. Uh, they are less and less related to the, uh, ag to the wheat mitochondria. So basically the take home message from this uh, matrix is that um, agrobacterium is probably closely related to the mitochondrion of the wheat. Okay, some of these other organisms are even more closely related uh, to one another. Uh, 52, 53% um, of these other, these other organisms, these other organisms are related to each other. But what, what we're really concerned about is the mitochondrion because remember the mitochondrion endosymbiosis the, the eukaryotes uh, uh, engulf the, uh, the uh, bacterial, uh, the aerobic bacteria, and it helps them to survive through those uh, aerobic uh, conditions uh, as they develop in the primitive Earth's atmosphere, when, you know, and so on down the line. And through evolutionary time, those mitochondria are incorporated, and they find their way into plants, and then we can find... That it looks like the most closely related um, bacterium in this matrix is uh, agrobacterium, which is uh, seems likely because agrobacterium does infect plants. It it finds its way into the plant uh, organism and creates little uh, tumors or nodules. So it wouldn't be surprising if uh, the plant mitochondria uh, evolved from a uh, ancestor of the of the bacteria. So these are all prokaryotes here, and this is the eukaryote, the plant, and the mitochondria, and the similarity right there, 48%. So that's what we're looking at right there. This is uh, from a uh, scientific skills exercise on page 485. Okay, here's us the recap of the of the um, of the uh, groups. Uh, this is basically, this is kind of what I want you to know anyway. Um, the major clades, the supergroups, Excavata, the SAR clade, Archaeoplastida. I want you to know that the uh, Unicanta gave rise to the uh, Epistaconts. The Epistaconts gave rise to the animals and fungi. Uh, the Archaeoplastida gave rise to the green algae, and the green algae gave rise to the uh, the green algae are related, share a common ancestor with plants. Okay, so this is a good table that helps uh, describe or summarize uh, the four supergroups of the table. Okay, so this is one hypothesis. It's the predominant hypothesis, the one proposed by your textbook. 